So tonight it's our great pleasure to welcome Raul Toussaint to the Leica Lounge. Raul is a documentary and underwater photographer who specializes in making images that convey what he refers to as the eternity of a moment. Raul has traveled extensively, building a collection of dramatic photographs that have been featured in Time, U.S. News, the New York Times, National Geographic Magazine, uh, among other publications. For over a decade, Raul has been a full-time educator and instructor, as many of his workshop uh, alumni can attest to. And he's been producing these all over the world, as well as for National Geographic expeditions. His images are represented by National Geographic Creative, Getty Images, and Corbis. His list of clients include the National Park Service, Apple, and the UN, for which he documented the operations in Sudan. And this evening, Raul will be talking about his uh, visual storytelling, and he's going to take us on a journey from the North Pole to the sands of the Sudan, to the streets of Guatemala for Easter week, and much more. So without further ado, I welcome Raul. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you, David, for, for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so many of the great names have been here before. Uh, between them, some of my mentors, like Maggie Stieber. I mean, uh, Maggie was my teacher many years ago. So it's, it's good to be in, in, this, in this temple of photography, let's put it that way, because I, I started as a Leica shooter. Anyway, so what I'm going to do tonight is take you to a little journey, uh, depending on how, um, how far along we get to. But um, I'll tell you a little bit of stories with um, some images. Okay, and all of them are long-term projects. And when I say long-term projects, are projects that have been going on for six, seven, eight years. And I keep working on them. And I don't want to finish them. I don't want to submit them to your graphic. I don't want to do anything with those images until I feel it's, it's done. So the, the first one is uh, Oaxaca and Day of the Death. Day of the Death is the most important celebration in Mexico. Uh, uh, I will say non-religious celebration in Mexico. And um, basically, it happens, you know, in the state of Oaxaca is my favorite place to go and photograph because it's, it's a place that uh, you have something different every day. From the divine, from the sublime, to the paganism uh, involved. Everybody has a view on this, on this particular day. And I'm very much involved into the heart of the matter, which is families. And something you're going to see in a lot of my pictures, when you see pictures like that, I do not crop pictures. I hate cropping pictures, okay? When you see pictures like this, that's a panorama. So basically, those are five or six pictures stitched together. So basically, nobody can move, or I gotta shoot fast enough so nobody else moves in the graveyard. And as you can imagine, they are slow shutter speed pictures, okay? Because it's dark, it's really, really dark. So I'm very much into, into the family part of the, of the equation, and this is the La Vida family. And I've been spending that night in Atzompa for many, many years with them, photographing the family, photographing the different uh, generations. You know, we meet once a year that night. We drink mezcal like there's no tomorrow, those of you who have been there. You see all the empty glasses over there. So, um, you know, we do spend a, a time of quality with the family. And that's where the pictures come from. Pictures are a byproduct of the experience. It's not the other way around. You don't go out to take pictures. You go out to live an experience, and the pictures will come out of that experience. And this is the head of the family, Maria. And I've been photographing Maria, I don't know, for how many years. And she also, she always came out with a red scarf. And by year three, I tell Maria, Maria, you know what? You know, next year, come out with something else. And she says, yeah, OK, bring me, bring me one. And I'll wear that one rather than me buying another one. So I got her that white one. Uh, this is her husband. And uh, this is uh, her brother-in-law. And as you can see, clearly, she has a preference to the husband, not so much for the brother-in-law, as you can see other decorations on the... Uh... Okay. Now, this is Maria's daughter. So I'm doing this kind of picture with the same generation every year, try to, trying something uh, different. They are not easy pictures to be shot. I mean, most of these pictures are one second, 
second and a half, two seconds to gain a little bit of, of uh, depth of field. Okay. This is the Ho Ho Cemetery. And people ask me, how come this is night of death and the cemetery is empty? It was raining. It was really, really raining. And I was the only one that actually stayed. And she stayed, and you see she has a, a raincoat on. But being part of this, being in there, <coughs> is what makes all this experience greater. Don Juan, his father died in 1964. His daughter, his granddaughter, and this is a really good example of what eternity of the moment means. That microsecond, that fraction of a second that happens, and you will never ever get it again. I still go every year and I sit down with him. Actually, he's the only person I actually sit down on that cemetery for the entire night, talking to him and see what's going on in his life. And, you know, now other people come, you know, other daughters, other, but this particular night, that particular moment is gone forever. And um, I gave him a big print of, of this, but he can barely see by now. This is in Mitla. When I started photographing these girls, they were like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most of my students have, have been there. And that's one of the typical altars of the dead. This is last year, yeah. One important fact, and, and again, this tying all these things together. First time I photograph in this altar, I photograph an old lady. I didn't know who she was. Happens that she was the mother of the owner of the house. And happens that a week after I shot the picture, she passed. So now that picture that, of her that I took in this is in their house. And that was the very first time I photographed this altar. This some years ago, introducing some movement on purpose on the, on the, during the exposure. And when you see pictures like this, when you see something like this that is out of focus in any of my, any of my pictures, I'm shooting literally less than nine inches away. I'm really, really close to my subject, okay? And having that interaction with them. Hermelinda. Now, as with everything with storytelling, I really like going into the details, the minute, the, all these details that makes or, or makes or break an event or make it great or historic. Now, we can see here all these kids. First thing, and why I shot this picture, immediately anybody that knows anything about Mexico knows it's Oaxaca because of the traditional dress. Okay? And then we have the very iconic Katrina, which has nothing to do with Day of the Death or the celebration of Day of the Death but it has become the icon of Day of the Death. Because the Katrina came about in 1926, more or less, from a painter uh, by the name of Jose Guadalupe Posadas. Has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the celebration, but it has become the icon of the celebration of Day of the Death. And obviously, it's what every try, everybody tries to emulate. This is our high school students. So you see, everybody tries to emulate this. One of the hardest pictures I ever shot. Yeah, under, under the rain, getting drenched, and with a child that had all the patience in the world to work with me. But as you can see, it's all trying to emulate the Katrina in a more artistic way. Okay? But then you have, if you look over there, the hat she's wearing in this, then you start seeing the Halloween influence. How Halloween and the American culture is beginning to be part of, of this thing. Okay? This is a dress all made of a uh, newspaper. Then we have the comparsa sinetla, which to this day I'm trying to understand what on earth it is. Okay? <laughs> because I don't understand what this thing is. It's all these people dressed as women. All of them are men. So every picture you're going to see of the comparsa is actually men. They're not women. And they come out in these extravagant things, and they dance around, and they dance, and they dance, and then dance. What are they trying to celebrate? Why they do? I have no clue, but. They are calling the spirits that are lingered, that lingered. They're drinking beer like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> is what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> including, including us. But, uh, you know. So all these men <laughs> come out in force 
dress spectacularly. I mean, look, look at the detail, look at the makeup. I mean, they are really, really well done uh, dress. So this is 100% a dude, you know, um, <laughs> photographed through the umbrella and the flashes outside the umbrella. And basically the only way you're gonna get this is if you get in and you dance with them and you're in and, and this madness as it happens. So you see, it makes absolutely no sense. Now we have a character of the Venice uh, Carnival right here in the middle of Mexico. And, uh, and as I said, here you see the Halloween influence. See this dress all ma made of uh, plastic spoons? I love this picture because it encompasses all. So you have Oaxaca, you have Katrina, you have the Mad Hatter, for some unexplained reason. So you have the Halloween tradition, you have Oaxaca, and if you look closely over there, she's having the mezcal, and she's having mezcal. Okay? Very much part of, of the tradition. Yeah, you guys know, I know. And as I say, I, 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 I want to be part of it, and I always you know, want to participate and be fun. And this is my family in Mexico. I mean, the La Vidas, they're, they're my family. There's Maria right there. The year she decided to wear a, a black one, and that's the year I decided I'm not going to photograph you but with that black thing, so I brought the, the, the sister up, the daughter up. There she is. So this is generation one, two, and three. And generation four, they sometimes bring the babies to the graveyard, but I mean, I don't want to flash them at the early or morning of the, you know, me buying, fl buying flowers and try to negotiate a better price. <laughs> you took a picture of me, you didn't give it to me. I, said, I just gave it to you 10 minutes ago. What are you talking about? You want a picture, you take it. Okay. Now we're going to go to a more somber thing. Uh, which is Sudan, and uh, Sudan is basically the, I would say it's the, what changed my life in so many ways as a photographer, as a human being, you know, going to Sudan and uh, witnessing what was going on there. Uh, Sudan, four million people dead over 25 years of war. They have a truce and then they have to decide if, after five years, if they're gonna continue being one single country or divide the country into, as it happened, North Sudan and South Sudan. Sudan in those days, biggest, biggest country uh, in Africa, biggest UN operation in the world. Um, and basically what the UN wanted me to do was to go out there and capture images that will tell the Sudanese people, this is what you're gonna get if you follow the path of peace, or this is what you're gonna get if you keep you know, uh, fighting the war. So, I mean, it was initially meant to be a, a campaign. It was an ad campaign, 100%. Uh, so I had to give the UN the kids smiling pictures and this and that, holding the oranges. But I knew that's not what I wanted to do. And I have the pretty pictures, the medium pictures, which is this set over here, and then the really bad pictures, which I, which I don't uh, show <laughs> at all. So this became the cover of the book. Uh, okay. Again, uh, if you think you have been to a bad place, I invite you to go to Sudan and see what bad really is. Uh, so I spent time in, in uh, the refugee camps a lot in Darfur. And for all intents and purposes, this is the Four Seasons in a, in, a, in a refugee camp. This is as good as it gets. You don't get anything better than this. Okay? And uh, so I went inside and talked to her, and I was fascinated by the fact that everything this person owns in life is in there. That's it. All she owns is over there, a, f a few uh, grain and those clothing and the two kids, that's it. That's as far as it goes for them. This is the kind of water they drink. And you know, I talk a lot, again, about the eternity of the moment. You know, the moment she turns around and that little breeze of air hits her and that makes the picture right there. I, I always, um, 
I always shoot my pictures uh, different probably from everybody. I mean, my philosophy when I compose a picture is background first, border second, subject third. So before I shoot a picture, I'm looking at the background and what's evolving back there to make sure I don't have a palm tree sticking out of anybody's head or I have an interesting background. So uh, what I try to do is compose my pictures back, border, so I don't cut anything in the border, and then the subject. It's cool. And what I love about this and when I have lecture in school is telling kids, you know what? Look at these kids. Look how well behaved they are, how clean they are, how respectful they are. And they don't have a thing. But they know for them, education is not a right, it's an obligation. And they understand that very well. So all of this is in the refugee camps. And these are their toys. So this is in Maui, this is in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, border with Uganda. And this is basically when the Uganda war was going on, this is where all the refugees came to. And then they came from, they went from Sudan to, to Uganda. Pretty toys, huh? And as I was shooting this picture, um, you know, I basically, uh, I, I drew a, a square on the floor and asked this kid, can you pick up any and everything you can uh, find in this little square? Can you pick it up for me? So, and so they did, and this is what they picked inside that little square. So basically where they're, where they're playing is, it's, it's a battlefield. Not only a battlefield, it's a minefield. And accidents do happen. So this is Jamal, he was 12 at the time and he lost his hand you know, playing with friends. And the friends told him, no, do not touch that, and he went and touched it, lost his hand, broke a leg, and that's his father. And this is where they live, and, and see how, again, how organized they are. They use the uh, plastic bottles to, uh, to put the plants in. This, this used to be, before the UN, the classroom for the girls. Again, remember, background first, border second, subject third. For me, the, the perfect picture is the right combination, and when I say combination slash composition of moment, place, light, and subject, okay? Moment, place, light, and subject. So I'm very much aware that any picture, any image I'm gonna produce has to have those four elements. Now, you might have all those four elements, okay? I might have the Leica store, which is a great location. I might have this beautiful lighting, I might have Pope Francis walk in the door and stand out there, great moment, but if I don't know where to put them, how to compose the picture, in a fraction of a second, I don't get the shot. I will, not, I will never give you leeway of understanding what my subject is. What I will give you is the leeway to interpret whatever you want about my pictures, okay? Everybody's reaction was like, wow. And that was my initial reaction. Again, I'm shooting with a 70 millimeter lens. I'm inside the incubator, that baby's right here. And I'm just thinking as I shoot, how on earth the UN wants me to convey something positive about this place? It's just impossible. And then I feel a hand that touches me like that. And when I turn around, there's this woman with the biggest smile ever. Wow, she was glowing. Who was she? the mother, okay? It was twins. Her twin died the day before, but one of them survived. They got one, and that one survived, and she's in an incubator, so she was happy, okay? Again, they have so little, but they, everything is so much for them. This is in the middle of the Sahara Desert with the nomadic tribes. Photography is prohibited in Sudan. So on top of that, they have never seen a camera. On top of that, they have been, they, I don't think they have ever seen a, a white man, let alone a Cuban. This is like, <laughs> you know? So I asked for coffee and stuff, and they, they actually had coffee, believe it or not. But anyway, these people, they kept pushing the girls out of the picture. 
Like I kept bringing the, the girls into the picture and they would push them out. They didn't want the girls in the picture. These are people that when I went up the hill, just like in the movies, they had the, the swords and they were doing their little thing and I said, this is it. But by the end of the day, they actually gave me a donkey as a gift, okay? Uh, a donkey like this big, it looked like a big dog. And I'm like, you know, telling the interpreter, you know, I cannot take this. And this are they. And you can see the difference in ethnicity with all these people. And this is all the way uh, in Kasala, this is all the way west of Sudan, nomadic tribes. And I walk in here and all there is is women and they will not allow me to photograph them inside, outside. But they were eager for me to photograph them inside. So they keep pushing me into the houses for me to photograph them. And I don't see a guy, I don't see a single dude in this sea of women. And I'm like, all right, if I walk inside and these guys that I saw two days ago with the swords in the desert come by now, and I'm with their wife inside the hut, I'm gonna get. But the nicest people, nicest, nicest people. Okay, moving on to one of my favorite projects, the Brotherhoods of Time. Brotherhoods of Time, I've been working for seven years in it. And basically, I decided to document what is the biggest um, religious celebration in the Western Hemisphere. This is in Antigua, Guatemala, Easter week. I just came from there a week and a half ago. Brotherhoods have been there for 650 something years. And their sole mission of the 16 biggest ones is to take care of those images right there. Images that are centuries old and all the celebration is about carrying this gigantic float. This is a hundred people carrying this float for 12 hours all over Antigua, Guatemala, you know, to a band. So, okay, that for me is the touristy side. So what I wanted to go was backstage, become part of them and understand, you know, what happens behind all of this. And that's something I've been uh, working on seven, for seven years. And it has taken a lot of time to gain access. This is very, very, very secretive, extremely secretive. And finally this year, after seven years, I gained access to one of the, the biggest one, which is Escuela de Cristo, and they're all though happy and... You made it? You made it to the door. Was it easy? Uh, no, Did no, no, no. He wants to, he wants to finish his master's degree. Oh, well. uh, it, was the last, it was the last year of Diego, so Diego is gone. Uh, also a panel that's 180 degrees, so this guy here with the, with the phone is right here, and this over here, it's right here. So that's 180 degrees of, of pictures. And you can see where the software missed, you know, it missed a little bit there. And all of this that you see here are sawdust um, carpets. Beautiful. I did meet the family this year. And made the, uh, they went to the presentation, to the final show of the students they came, the people that make this. Okay. They don't pay in, uh, actually, they don't have to pay in Sicily. No. The oh. seniors uh, get paid. Oh, maybe. The family, the family just goes behind. And it, it's a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And, and uh, you see all this wonderful, you know, artwork on the street, which basically the float uh, comes over. I like to play a lot with movement. You know, same thing, why I use movement in this picture to draw the attention to the, to, the, to the carpet. So that's a one second handheld picture right there. And I know a lot of you are gonna say, one second handheld, it's all in your head. You can totally do it. Oh, another thing that I failed to mention, I have never ever shot a picture in RAW, nor I have ever ever used a camera in other setting than manual, okay? No P or S or Y or First and foremost, I don't understand them. So, oh, oh, okay. This is Escuela de Cristo. That's a silver cross from the 1700s. Okay. Um, last year I did carry that cross and it's very, very heavy. So finally I got access with these guys and they're all over social media praising my pictures. And, okay. It is by far the most extreme shooting condition you can ever encounter. Night, fire, smoke, 
You cannot use flash because that flash is not going to go nowhere. You barely see what's in front of you. You, you hear pe people coughing and I mean, it's, it's really, really difficult to photograph, but it's wonderful. But one of the things that fascinates me, and this is why I need to be so careful how I present this or how do I write the book, which I decided this year to put it in, in the hands of Padre Fernando, so he's going to write the book, uh, the, the priest of the biggest. It is. Oh, um, uh, Enrique Verdu, yeah, the historian of the city. So here's what it is, reality, myth and reality, reality. This is a highly racist celebration. So you have Escuela de Cristo, which is just like this, okay? Beautiful people, green eyes, tall guys, and then you have the other ones, which are clearly Mayan, okay? So there's a big difference between the Mayans and the white. Now what the, the, the white, uh, you know, the certain brotherhoods, what they do is actually they hire the Mayans to become the back characters in the procession. So every single Roman guard is Mayan. Every single, <laughs> so all the, uh, Judas, Mayan. The, the thieves, Mayan. So they pay the Mayans to become the back characters. And then there's the mix. So this is Escuela de Cristo, this is Merced, and this is San Felipe. So there's three brotherhoods and you can clearly see. Now there's the women component to the whole thing. So there's the float for the men and the float for the women. Okay? Mayan, Mayan. So you're gonna carry stuff, you're gonna do, you're gonna be, you're gonna be a, okay, San Cristobal. Again, moment, place, light, and subject. Rule of thirds, frame within a frame. And all of this within a fraction of a second because this goes away really quickly. Escuela de Cristo. And it's finding, you know, this is, guys, think of this. One of the brotherhoods, they have 9,000 carriers. 9,000 people from the brotherhood are going to carry during the 12 hours. There's 250,000 people in the city. So you got to dig for this moment and find them, okay? And approach them in a quick way. Because, I mean, something like this, it looks beautiful, but in a minute, this is going to be covered in smoke and it's gone. So everything you see here is available light, okay? No flash, no nothing, because it's impossible. So this is light coming from the candles. This is Escuela de Cristo. San Felipe, which is clearly a Mayan. Uh, this is one of the top brothers. And um, you can also see the size. Mayan people tend to be very, you know, they're not tall at all. They're the nicest people on the planet. <coughs> and there they are. Roman guards. Now, this, these are not Mayan. These are the soldiers that did from the Guatemalan army that did something really bad during the year, and this is how they get punished. They gotta come at midnight, at midnight, and run in horses all through town, chasing, uh, chasing, chasing Jesus to be arrest him. And that particular year, it rained, so they're all soaking wet. This is like three in the morning, and they just finished. They just brought Jesus in. But it's a punishment for doing something bad in the army. They get to do this. Again, another panel. And this is the stuff you really got to do fast, because if that guy over there moves, you will have him here and then, then, then in this frame. So again, that's 180 degrees, probably 10 frames, okay? backlit by the moon. And it's probably one, two, three, four, five frames. And this is how much people there's there. I mean, there's a lot of people, lot, lots of people. So all this space will be full of people over here.
always the president takes out the float. Clearly a bad dude. I don't know who, but he's Mayan, he's bad. <laughs> he has one of those funny hats, he's bad. <laughs> and again, the women component is a big time and it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. I love this picture because it's the only time because they put the floor and the, the, the float on the floor that I can balance the exposure between the image and them. So it's the only picture I have of them and, and it's because they put the floor, the, the float on the floor. But more interesting than that, it has like a big, big, big typo on the front. Reina with a Y. I mean that's this is the main subject of this flow, then I'm going to put a typo right in there for everybody to see and nobody notice it. <laughs> Generations. It used to be in the past, this used to be based on profession. Okay, so if you were a carpenter, you were part of the St. Joseph uh, Brotherhood. If you were uh, so on and so forth, depending on your, then it became ethnicity. Okay, if you were San Cristobal, you were clearly Mayan. If you were La Merced, you were mixed. If you were Escuela de Cristo, you were Spaniard. But now it has become a family thing. Generations and generations and generations of these little children. And I've seen babies, uh, you know, walk in the processions. This is the kids, the children's procession from Merced. And I think this picture communicates how difficult it is. I mean, this is exactly what it is. It's all this smoke and, you know, difference in exposure. And, I mean, you never know. You cannot adjust exposure. So you put your ISO up to the roof, wide aperture, and hope for the best. And hope that something um, evolve. Actually, Escuela de Cristo used this as a poster this year because that's their main banner, you know. And all the smoke coming behind. Again, another panel. Shooting really quickly because nobody can move. Anybody moves, it's in the next frame. And that gives you a really good idea of how this looks. You know, and again, 180 degrees from the cathedral, all the people with candle, on into the, the street. And yeah, you gotta be part of it. <laughs> so uh, I've, been I've been part of Merced for, for three years now. I'm gonna become part of Escuela de Cristo next year. Uh, yeah. Ooh, that's, <laughs> it. Ooh, that's it. That's, it. that's the one. Yeah. One day I'll be president of one of those brotherhoods, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. So next year I'll be wearing this and uh, the black one on, on Friday. You know, this year I always have the deal with the freaking shoes. I mean, you gotta walk with these shoes for five or six hours. And I'm like, I, you know, why? They need to be black shoes. So this year I didn't have black shoes, so I have this um, top siders on. I say, okay. So I put the top sider and start walking. And when I start walking, I look at the priest who's walking right next to me, and he's in Crocs. <laughs> You know, Padre Fernando is in Crocs. And he was very much into photography. He really likes photography. This is the priest of the biggest. Um, so I'm like walking with him, hours on end. And he's shooting pictures left and right. And he's putting me under the float. Hey, get down there. You will see how beautiful this is. And I'm like, you know, under a float? You can you imagine? No, no. Anyway, by the th second hour, I tell him, Fernando, you know what? You need to start praying, dude. You know, do your, do your father thing. Visions of my world, and um, this is basically where it's something I'm working on right now. Three years ago, have you told me um, you are going to be a landscape photographer? I would have said, get out of here. No way on the planet I'm going to be a landscape photographer. But you know what? It became a challenge, a challenge to shoot something that so many people have shot so many times, and I wanted to make it different. I wanted to convey that 
eternity of the moment. I wanted to convey the famous moment, place, light, and subject thing. I wanted to experiment with big panoramas. My biggest panorama has actually 113 frames. It's the size of that wall. Why? Because I wanted something new. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to push myself to do something different. And then this guy came along. And that's when this become really interesting. So two years ago, National Geographic decides to do the fine art galleries. And they tell me, listen, we're going to open 50 galleries in the United States, top class galleries, Apple Store kind of galleries. And we want you to join us. We're only going to choose 25 photographers. And we want you to join me. And I'm like, you know, when you have your name next to Bill Allard, or you have your name next to Ryan Randy Olson, or Joel Saltor, or Tim Lyman, that's big stuff. You know the reason I'm in there? Not because of my name, not because of what I do, because most of what I do is to pan the camera and give them the stuff that they love, is because of the panoramas. Because of that idea of one day shooting these big panels that makes big prints that none of these guys for some reason have decided to do, and I'm the one doing it. So I started shooting, you know, panoramas. And this is actually a panorama. This is actually six pictures, 30 seconds per frame. And you're praying for the light not to change. If it changed, the picture is gone. Okay? And you're praying for dear life because you are basically down here looking down and shooting this thing. So this is in Iceland. Huh? Oh, it was very windy, and it, it, there was a big storm coming that way. And my driver is saying, dude, if you're not here by 5, you're left by yourself. You know, you, you either get out or... And this is in autumn. So this is in the winter. This is in autumn. Iceland. This is Detifoss. Those of you who have been seen the movie Prometheus, when it opens, that the guy is jumping, it was shot right there. This is that over there. So the, the opening scene of that movie is shot from, from there. I don't need to tell you how dangerous is this, but uh, it is very dangerous and very, but, but this is two weeks uh, after this picture was shot. The only difference is that I shot one more frame on this picture, that's why you see it more. Okay, so all of this is Iceland and, you know, big panels. Again, no Photoshop. This is how it came out of the camera. I will kill myself before you see Photoshop. This is in the peninsula. That's another glacier over there. I know the name of the places, but I cannot mention them. It's too complex. Okay. Okay. Says. Yeah, this isn't big behind the, behind the gas station. <laughs> okay. Vic. Vic. Yeah, behind. You walk behind the gas station, and that's where you shot that from. There's rocks here. You got on top of the, the rocks, tripod. Uh, Joe, you were asking about the, the filters. That's there right there. So that's the two filters together. Okay. The ice lagoon. Iceland is one spectacular place. It is my favorite country in the planet by far. Okay, one of the glacier lagoons. What time of the year was that? Uh, this, believe it or not, that's November. November. For some unexplained reason, it was like that. You don't see that like that in November at all, but it was like that. Cold, extremely cold. You can see the wind blowing. This is in the Highlands. This is actually six, 12, 12 wide angle frames. So that's shot at 17 starting down here. So that rock over here. That's the other uh, waterfall across the beach? No, 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 no. This is in wherever the continent of Iduit is. So basically, guys, this is America and that's Europe. And this is, the, this is where the, con the plates come through. So, huh? 
Yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That place. That place. So anyway, this rock, it's down here. It's right down there. So I'm shooting six frames this way, 30 seconds each. Uh, uh, six frames, 30 seconds over here to give you 180 degrees. And that's what I mean. I want to have the picture that nobody has. I want to push myself to get that unique image that nobody has. Probably early morning. Wonderful place to photograph. This is in the peninsula too, during the autumn. And I love this picture. And just recently, I'm sitting somewhere and, I mean, I've seen this picture I don't know how many times. Till somebody pointed out that you see the skull. And now where's the skull? The skull is right there. And since that day, it freaked me out. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm the next Peter Lick. I mean, Peter got this $6.3 million because of the spirit in the, in the ray. Maybe I will get it because of the skull in the sky. And the scarf, look at the scarf and the jacket. Yeah, the jacket there. Anyway, freaky. <laughs> really, really freaky. If you have never seen the Northern Lights, one of the most amazing things you can ever witness. Is that no, no, it's one. No. So where do you, where do you set your exposure? You're doing manual. Church. Church. Brightest point of reflected light. Always. The church. Now, point in case, this becomes a problem. Right there. But, you know, I meet her here, and I got to live with that exposure. What I do is I do two 30-second exposures. Okay? I give it a minute. Rather than 30 seconds, I give it a minute. Why? So they can move. Oh, the light. Yeah, the lights move. So they're constantly moving. So I want to, I cannot give it one one minute exposure because then you see the earth rotation. Mm. You don't want that. So what I do is, it's kind of using HDR in camera to prolong the exposure and, and keep, keep maintaining the exposure value. So that's what I did there. But it's wonderful everywhere you look. So this is where I was shooting, right there. And this is the 180 degree view of the entire canyon. Just like that, no Photoshop, no nothing. And it came out black and white, and I love this picture. And if you see this picture printed that size, it's just spectacular. This is Godafoss. You can photograph it from there or from this other side. Six frames, 30 seconds each. What software do you use? Auto Pano. Auto Pano Pro. Not as because it's the best, it's because it's the fastest. <laughs> you know, you can leave overnight doing 60, 70, 80 panels, and it will do it over, overnight. Is it because you can mask away softly? Yeah, well, I don't know. That's too complicated for me. I don't know how to do any of that. Anyway, it's fast, and it's good, and it's like 90 bucks. Um, so this is Godafoss, and this is, this is, you know, yeah, but I, what's the name of this one? Anyway, this is, uh, this is by volume the biggest, um, no, the biggest waterfall volume-wise in Europe. This one is the biggest waterfall in size in Europe. And then I, st I started really, really getting involved with astrophotography, and I love doing astrophotography. So basically, uh, every summer, I go out to the desert and start doing this. Now, this is my first attempt at a six frame, 30 second exposure of the Milky Way. So I can get basically the entire Milky Way. This is painted with a, with a flashlight, and this is a car that is li lighting this side over here from behind this. So major production. So every July 2nd, July 3rd, at midnight, you will find me in there with my students trying to do some version of this. This is landscape arch, multiple meteors. Is it still alive? Yeah, it is. No, the, that little piece was the one that fell. 
still there. <laughs> yeah, I just hope to be there when it falls. I'm going to get that picture. It's going to happen on mine. So again, this is two flashlight lighting the whole thing. This is one of the most complex pictures ever because if what happens is, remember, if I'm painting, all of this is done within 30 seconds. So if I'm painting with a flashlight, okay, that rock is literally here, and that arch is probably across the street over there. So I got to go like paint this really quickly, and then this wall a little bit more, and then back there I need to paint a lot, and they come here and do one, all of that in 30 seconds. So yeah, it takes a lot of trial and error. Don't ever think I did one this in one picture. It's impossible. 3 a.m., big lightning. Uh, okay. So again, I'm looking for all this wonderful um, places and moments. Mesa Arch, a panel of Mesa Arch. If you're sitting on the floor, Mesa Arch is this big. And then you get there at 3 in the morning and you basically crawl to see what's, to see what's underneath. That's why you get there at 3 in the morning. <laughs> I get there in the 3 in the morning, and what we do. Yeah. No, no, we get there at 3. Well, to claim our space, time. we open the tripods, and we block the Japanese from coming in. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, the Japanese will climb up here. Yeah. It's horrible. And they will push you, and they will. So basically, we get there at three, we open the, the legs of the tripod, and basically I, I put them in a line to block uh, so they cannot. Okay. What I have found in this, all this wonderful, wonderful moments and star experimenting with flash and other techniques to make, uh, that's the Peter Lick picture. This one is worth a penny, that one. Did. Yeah, but I need, I need the spirit here. Or the six. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll sell it. I, I, I'll sell it to you for twenty bucks. <laughs> if you want, I'll sell it to you for twenty bucks. Okay, Dead Valley. Now, whenever you find water in Dead Valley, like this summer, you shoot and you shoot and you shoot and you shoot. Okay, it's a risky point in Dead Valley. That valley under a thunderstorm and a snowstorm. Bad water, lowest place in the Western Hemisphere, 263 seven feet below sea level. Light painting at night. Milky Way in that valley. Yeah, all of those pictures are 2.8. All of them. All of all these pictures, they ain't rocket science. You don't need to go to one of my workshops to know this. 30 seconds, 2.8 uh, ISO 800. That's it. Put it in a timer, run, so you can paint sideways so it looks dramatic, and then you go back. And that's it. It ain't rocket science. Okay. Our neighborhood, the Everglades, that's in uh, Loop Road. That was actually the lead picture for the story in Geographic on the Everglades some years ago that I did. This is the stuff that sells in the gallery. You know, one second picture, hold half a second steady, pan down, and that will make the picture. People love this stuff. <laughs> do that, go to the Everglades. I mean, I know the Everglades is the hardest place to photograph ever. Go there and do this and sell it. People love this stuff. This one thanks to Fabiola and Alfred because they took me to, uh, to Blue Cypress. This is the real tree. This is the reflection. Obviously, it's mega overexposed to get rid of everything. A panel, four frames. The gallery loved that. And I love it too. I think it's. But thank But no wind whatsoever. I was afraid to move the boat. It was like. Beautiful. Oh, you were there. You too were there. You know, yeah. Uh, great sand dune. Again, the eternity of the moment. This will never happen again. Moment, place, subject, light. Frame within a frame. So that house is where it needs to be. 
That subject is probably 5% of the entire picture. Your attention goes there like that. Great sand dunes during a sandstorm. Uh, white sands under a, uh, see how the, the water never reaches the desert? Joshua Tree National Park, the most boring national park in the US. <laughs> There's no pictures to be made there. Don't go there, especially during the day. Do not go there. As much as I say go to the other national parks, Joshua Tree, hmm, I don't know. Anyway, this is 100% uh, moonlight, except for the tree that I lit with a flashlight, but everything else is moonlight. Okay, you can see all the stars out. This is the only time you want to be out there. Go home, have a beer, and that's it. Okay. Then I started taking that panel thing to the extreme. Hey, people love this. Let me take it to the extreme. So this is actually what I call a panning panel. So I'm panning every frame, and then the next frame I need to pan at the exact same speed so the, so the software can match the picture. So this is in the Mirror Woods in, uh, near San Francisco. And this is, again, if you look at this picture printed, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's all in handheld? Yeah. Well, not everyone. No, this, obviously, I'm moving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you doing 30 seconds in? No, no, no. One second. Okay. okay. One second. You hold steady the camera for half a second, and then you pan. And then you come here, and you hold half a second, and then you pan and so on and so forth, and then you pray that it comes out. <laughs> Verticals. Verticals. Remember, vertical gives you more coverage. Uh, bridal veil. Just, um, Yosemite in a very unique winter because there was not water for a couple of uh, years. Uh, this is... No, this is, no, 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 Joshua Tree, no. No, this is actually Red Rock Canyon near Las Vegas. I was driving to that valley and all, all this, this beautiful snowstorm came and I went into the park and got this picture. And, you know, in an hour it, all, it was all gone. Lake Placid, six frames, 10 seconds each. Uh, Bryce, again, during a snowstorm, nobody inside. I was the only one out there. Boy, I was mad that day. I lost my phone. I crashed a car. I <laughs> well, I didn't crash a car. I, I, I'm about to get in my car, and, and the park ranger says, you cannot move. You're in an accident. And I'm like, I'm not in, well, I'm in an accident. I mean, I, well, I, uh, uh, again, Japanese have come and crashed into my car, and I didn't notice that they were there. Zion. Well, yeah. Zion, again, I'm basically in one of these cliffs up here. And this is actually six and eight. This is 24 frames of a snowstorm <laughs> coming. I mean, this, this place is gigantic. It's called the Temple of, see, well, yeah, I don't know, some weird name. But anyway, uh, Monument Valley. Monument Valley. So I knew there was a big powwow in the park, so I waited. And obviously, these are not the same cars. Okay, so I shot this frame, right? And then waited here for another car to come, waited, shot this frame, because this is a hill. When they go up the hill, they go slower, so the lights are there for a longer time. And then made that, Monument Valley. The beauty about Monument Valley, you shoot every single great picture from the parking lot. You don't need to do anything. You just walk to the parking lot, and all these pictures are shot from the, from the parking lot. Greenland, East Greenland, East Greenland, Greenland. This is the biggest fjord system in the world. You can spend five days in there. I'm looking at a way of taking students in there, but the, I mean, it's really, really complicated. Morning light, overexposed. I shot two pictures and then sat down for two hours to eat raspberries. I mean, for uh, blueberries from that field. I mean, nobody comes here and that's full of blueberries. 
uh, Nuke Greenland. No, no, this is this is Nuke. This is when I did the Northwest Passage. I basically spent a month crossing from Nome, Alaska to Nuke Greenland over the pole. Panel of a polar bear. I'm telling the dude, do not move, please. <laughs> Baffin Island. Uh, I don't remember, somewhere up there. Wow. So all these pictures, I will see is the midnight sun going on. So all of these pictures are like 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, you know, uh, being out there in that cold. This is Franz Joseph Land. This is the closest I've been to the, to the North Pole. So I'm 800 nautical miles from the North Pole. <coughs> Mid midnight, uh, Russian Arctic. We park the boat, we open the bow, and we jump in the water. So I did the, pol I did the polar plunge at midnight on Franz Joseph Land. And uh, if you want to really experience something big, uh, that's it. So I mean, I'm going to stop here so I can get some Q&A. Um, and again, you got to live the experience to get the pictures. Never do something as stupid as this. It is extremely mega insane every time that thing blew i mean i was pushed back so i couldn't get <coughs> the picture i had to move to this vantage point to actually shoot at a slow shorter speed because that thing was killing me okay yeah no all right, <laughs> all right so questions <laughs>